everyone. So this talk today is mostly a story of, of research. I'm going to talk uh, initially about a set of maps that I found that I was really curious about, um, and then go into what their legacies are with, with maps today, at least in terms of design. So four maps, alike in dignity, um, all created within about 25 years of each other. Um, each of them are depicting mostly the same thing, which is uh, lighthouses and their characteristics. So uh, characteristics refer to the, the pattern of the, the light flashing, the color of the lights, uh, and the, the height of the structure. So that's a uh, technical term. Uh, so one is of the British Isles, uh, one is of Finland, one is of China around Shanghai, and uh, one is of New Zealand. All of them use pretty similar symbolization, uh, but I haven't been able to find really any other examples of this, uh, this style of map. Um, so I thought that these cartographers might be connected somehow, so I started looking into it. Uh, this is the first map that I found. Uh, this was published in 1900 by Augustus Koch. Um, the, he was born in Germany in 1840 and eventually moved to Wisconsin. Uh, he served as a clerk and a draftsman during the Civil War. He's best known for these panoramic bird's eye view maps. Uh, I grew up in Austin, and if there was a home or a business that had a bird's eye view map of Austin, it would, it would be this one. Uh, he created maps for a lot of other cities, including Norfolk. Um, he also uh, created maps for Houston, San Antonio, spent a lot of time in Texas, um, Aspen, Seattle, Atlanta, Jacksonville, Salt Lake City, Boise, but nothing from New Zealand and nothing that I could find that even looked like the New Zealand map. So after a few months of doing research off and on, I figured out that there are in fact two Augustus Cokes, both born around the same time, both active around the same time, both cartographers, one lived in New Zealand, the other one lived in Wisconsin. So this is the, uh, the New Zealand Augustus Coke. Um, so once I figured out what was going on, I was able to distinguish between the two. This, is, this looks much more in line with what I was uh, initially finding. So he did a lot of maps in the service of uh, colonial surveys of the North Island of New Zealand. Um, but unfortunately, I couldn't find any more maps of lighthouses specifically. So search continued. Uh, I found the second map. This is of Finland also focusing primarily on lighthouses. Um, this was published in 1889 as part of what the Google Translate version of Finnish Wikipedia says was one of the first national atlases ever published. Um, this is the cover of that. This charming and totally not haunted portrait uh, is of the team's leader, Mr. Uh, E.R. Neovius. I might be pronouncing that incorrectly. Um, he led a team that was sponsored by the government to create this, this national atlas. Uh, it included a zoologist, a botanist, a historian, a geologist, but I couldn't find any mention of cartographers in particular. That being said, portions of the atlas were uh, presented at the Sixth International Geographic Congress in London in 1895, and I was able to track down a 1,000 plus page report of the proceedings. It was absolutely riveting. Um, and, but I couldn't find any mention of any of the other cartographers that um, I was looking for. This is the third map. This is the earliest one that I found. It's published in 1874 by Woolfield H.F. Harding. Um, the auction website that I got this image from, uh, even they said that there's almost no information about this person. Um, this is the only known map under this name that was published by him. Um, we do know that he was a church warden in a town outside of London. He had a wife named Isabella and two children, and that was about it. Um, this is an excerpt from a book about his town, which is really more of a compendium of council proceedings, um, and the, the, that's about it. Um, it's a pretty similar story with this map. It was published in 1894 by H.C. Mueller. There's absolutely zero information about this guy. Couldn't find anything at all, um, nothing. So at this point, I'm feeling really super great about the abstract that I submitted to NASIS and uh, very confident about um, what I'll be presenting. That being said, there's still some, some pretty striking similarities. So that's, that's why I thought this, they were maybe connected in the first place. Um, so I wanna talk about how they work. Um, so in case you're not familiar with maritime navigation, which 
I wasn't really when I started this. Um, lighthouses that are within visible range of each other need to have distinctive uh, flashing patterns so that you can distinguish between the two. Uh, the pattern itself isn't really coded for any particular meaning besides the fact that it belongs to a particular lighthouse in a particular, particular location. Um, sometimes they have Morse code, but that's for special situations. Most of them, it, the pattern is largely, largely arbitrary. Um, so here's a close-up of the New Zealand map. Each circle is centered on a lighthouse, and the radius of the circle corresponds to its visibility distance. It's all in, in nautical miles. Uh, the colors correspond to the color of the light. In this case, yellow is white, red is red, uh, green is in another part of the map. Um, the pointed beams indicate that the light is flashing, while the solid beams uh, indicate a revolving motion. And then the one on the left here, right here, in farewell spit, which is also a superb euphemism for dry mouth, um, is what's called an iso isophase pattern, uh, which means that it's, uh, it's on for as long as it's off. And just to give you a sense of what that looks like, the, uh, yeah. so the lighthouse on the top has a revolving light, the lighthouse on the bottom has a flashing light. And isn't that so peaceful? Um, so this is the finished map, it works pretty similarly. In the center, this one right here, uh, we have a, uh, two lights emanating from the same lighthouse. Uh, one is a steady white light, which is the sort of beige circle, um, and that's complemented by a flashing red light, which is represented by the red beams coming out. I'm not sure how this one works. There are these sort of notch lines that you can see. My best guess is that there's a, a bright flash and that's immediately followed by a slightly darker flash, but the legend isn't super helpful. Um, I haven't been able to see that characteristic in any other lighthouses, so not exactly sure what's going on. If anybody has any insight, please let me know. Uh, just to briefly show you, so this is the same, different portion of the same map. Uh, this is a lighthouse with alternating flashing lights and then a revolving light. So by now you can probably figure out what's going on with the British map. Uh, we have alternating flashing red and white lights. We have rotating lights. Uh, we have steady or fixed lights. This one near Belfast, right here, that's showing uh, what's called an occulting pattern, uh, which means that it's, uh, the, the light is longer, is on longer for, than it is off, um, or it's, it's brighter for longer than it's dark. So the Chinese map, which I've adjusted the saturation a little bit because it's, it's kind of hard to see, um, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out. The, again, the legend isn't super helpful. Um, the light phases start at zero degrees, so I, presumably they correspond to a particular length of time. I haven't been able to figure out exactly what that is. I've measured it by degrees, um, actual minutes and seconds on a clock. It doesn't really seem to correspond to seconds or minutes. Um, it's difficult to see, but this right here, that's no, impossible to see. Um, that says, it's abbreviated, it says light flashes every minute. Um, so how that is a minute, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, regardless, you get, a, you get a general idea of what you're expecting to see if you're on a ship uh, looking at these lighthouses. So most maps that depict lighthouses usually use points, like this one. Um, sometimes they note the light characteristics, oftentimes they don't, they just have the name of the lighthouse. Uh, also pretty common is to just have a line showing the extent of uh, the, the visibility of the lighthouse. And the characteristics, like this one, are usually listed either right next to the lighthouse or on, on the edge of the circle. But none of them are quite like these. Uh, so I was thinking th there's got to be some sort of connection between them. Maybe the cartographers uh, had some sort of correspondence or they met at uh, an exposition, like a ye old nasus thing, something. Um, so, after several months of research, this is what I found. Nothing. <laughs> so, thanks for coming. Um, send me an email. Uh, um, I think the moral of the story is that light is really difficult to represent, symbolically and perhaps more importantly, volumetrically. Um, light not just as a point, but as an expansive or a continuous phenomenon. So. This is how lighthouses are depicted in contemporary nautical charts. This is a zoomed in portion of the, the chart that was just up on the screen. 
Um, there's a standard notation that they use for the lighthouse characteristic, so it's right here. This is right across the water from where we are. Um, so that's the lighthouse itself, that's the name, these are the characteristics. Uh, so this one flashes, it, it flashes in groups of two, the color is red, it flashes every 12 seconds, and the structure is 54 feet high, and it can be seen for 14 nautical miles, so that's how that's represented. Uh, the dotted lines on either side of the lighthouse indicate the extent to which a fixed white light is visible, that's called a, a, sector, a sector light. And this, is, uh, this representation is different depending on what you're viewing it on. So on the left, uh, we have standard nautical charts, and that's, um, th those are used worldwide, internationally. On the right are uh, marine GPS units, or what's called uh, chart plotters. That's just to give you an idea of, of what you would be seeing um, if you were using one of these on a boat. They still don't share the same aesthetic quality that I was looking for. Um, so I started to expand my search to maps of light more generally, not just uh, in terms of lighthouses. Um, and one of the more common instances of light appearing, uh, especially volumetrically, is in the case of, of uh, security, which I guess arguably lighthouses would fall under as well. Um, but this is a map of the Penn State campus showing which walkways are brightly illuminated at night. This is a project from our good friend John Nelson. Um, it's a planning tool for uh, security boxes on campuses, so they usually have the blue light on the top, and this gives you a, is sort of a, a light view shed analysis. Um, and this was based, this is actually also the closest I could find stylistically to the historical maps that I, that, uh, I was looking at. Uh, that was in turn based on a thesis by Sam Lipscomb, uh, doing view shed analysis for security boxes on the uh, Central Michigan University campus. Uh, this color ramp is showing the amount of visibility that you have for, for each light. Um, but if light isn't visualized uh, symbolically, it's usually depicted as imagery. We're all pretty familiar with this one at this point. Um, arguably, this is a map. I would say that it counts as one, but it's, it's not a map uh, in the spirit of what I've been, been looking for. Um, but that doesn't mean that light can't be symbolized. Uh, this is probably one of my favorite examples um, that I've seen from uh, uh, Jacob Wasilkowski uh, using light as terrain data. And this is actually interactive, so if you haven't uh, gotten a chance to play around with it, you should look it up afterwards, recommend it. Um, this is one of the few examples that I've seen that starts to get at the fact that light travels upwards, unless it's being uh, obstructed. And then, uh, so I want to end with sort of a in an activist spirit, I suppose. Um, my challenge to cartographers is to try and think, when appropriate, uh, of light as volumetric or expansive or continuous or even material. Uh, the photographs of Trevor Paglin, uh, which again are not maps per se, but he is a geographer, uh, they strike me as being good examples of the spatiality of light. So you can see the light that he captures uh, has this sort of emissive quality, uh, coming from what, in this case, is a, a military surveillance space. Uh, the light pervades the scene, almost like sort of a gas. Um, it emanates from points, but it characterizes the entire landscape. Um, and because of this tendency towards pervasiveness and ubiquity, uh, we often take illumination for granted, but I, I think if we pay more attention to uh, who or what it is we're illuminating, we might be able to start realizing who or what it is we might deem worthy of illumination. And I'll end with that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Harrison? Uh, that was a really fantastic talk on a really interesting subject. I have two questions. I guess you can just choose one. Um, did you, often with uh, lighthouses, there's foghorns, did you come across any ways of, ma of you know, spatially mapping um, foghorn sounds? And how did they measure the visible light from, um, from the lighthouse? Like they had those circles. Do you know how they were able to get that? 
The second one is probably a grad student in a little boat. Uh, it was a grad student in a boat. Um, I <laughs> probably um, I haven't seen any uh, any maps that represent foghorn extent um, in the way that the lighthouses are are represented. Um, it's usually like lighthouses today. It's it's noted uh, on the um, actual lighthouse. It's it says there's a particular type of of foghorn, for instance, um, because there are different types. There's some that can be activated, and some are just like always on. Um, and then uh, what was your second question? Oh yeah, so the grad students. Um, I think they just got on a boat and and went out there. It has to be on a clear night, obviously. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, I think it was as easy as that. Any other questions? No, then I would like to thank uh, all of our speakers for uh, providing us with some very great information in this session.